Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're going to be talking with Mr. Tim Shope from Avid Solutions, who is the, he is the director of digital transformation. And Tim's going to be talking with us about COVID nineteen and how that has impacted manufacturing. It will likely never be the same again. And Tim brings a lot of knowledge and insight to this topic. So welcome, Tim. How are you doing today? Hey, Chris. How are you? I am doing great. Doing great. And Tim, I know you're going to bring a lot of information to our listeners out here. This is a very pertinent topic right now that the world we're living in. Can you help maybe start off with helping our listeners understand some of the areas that you see that will be impacted in the manufacturing environment? Certainly. You know, I think we're uh, currently in week five, I believe, of, of stay at home. Um, and I think some of the things that we have seen change and evolve is our, our customers, our clients, or starting to have to restrict more and more third-party access to their sites. Uh, you know, for the first couple of weeks, there wasn't a whole lot of change in the manufacturing environment. But as it evolved and as some uh, facilities were affected, you know, the first thing they did was essentially go into a lockdown as far as letting uh, vendors or third parties or, or contractors on site, and which was absolutely the right thing to do to, to help try to protect their workforce and protect their ability to manufacture. But I, I don't know how many of the uh, the listeners have been on the other side of the uh, the desk or, or the fence and been a uh, a production staff in a facility. But you know the ecosphere of support for your automation for your uh, your your vendor supplied equipment is much larger than just your maintenance staff on site. And honestly, over the past 15 to 20 years, the uh, engineering and maintenance staffs on most sites, like everyone else, has gotten a little leaner and a little thinner, and they've actually relied a lot more on that external support or, or ecosphere. So one of the, the biggest things we've seen is how do you support it remotely, and how do you get you know, a lot of the, the majors may already have uh, the ability to have remote support through uh, VPNs or uh, other means of, of connectivity and be able to get into their process control or their automation side, their OT layer. But a lot of the, uh, the second and third tier manufacturing facilities don't necessarily have those opportunities or the way that they have it done is not necessarily the most secure so one of the uh, one of the biggest things that we've seen over the the transition is the ability, and we've we've sought out a number of uh, new technologies that allow us to uh, basically drop ship uh, secure remote connectivity to a customer. So virtually anyone uh, in in the customer site that can plug in a, a edge device and get it into a uh, northbound access to the internet it can actually tunnel out and meets with a, a, a virtual node in, in a cloud environment that can create that secure connectivity so that and that affords the customer the ability to have their OEM suppliers vendors or even their own internal uh, remote resources be able to access and see what's going on yeah. Sorry, Tim. So you, when you were saying you're drop shipping that that uh, secure remote connectivity right there to the site, so that is a customized solution. Was that been in process prior to COVID with you guys, or is this kind of a new new idea since you know COVID is obviously impacting people more and more? <laughs> that's a uh, that's a great question, and it's, it's going to make me look like I had absolutely no vision. Uh, but the uh, the, the uh, technology company that, that we wound up going with, they actually, in late December, almost the week before Christmas, set up a, a remote demonstration for me to show me this technology and the capabilities that they had. You know, I was I was impressed. Uh, I was enthralled with the, the, the thought and the possibilities of it. But 
at the time I didn't have an application or a real need that really, you know, was a catalyst for me to say, yeah, we need to do this. You know, so by the, uh, the, the first week of March, I had a catalyst, you know, the, the very first thing I did was call them back up and say, Hey, we need to, we need to rediscuss this and, and, and take a look at it. So, uh, yeah, I, I saw it and I was aware of it and kind of had it on the back burner. Like, uh, a lot of people, I think, uh, you know, one of the, uh, whether you call it a meme or not, one of the, one of the things I've seen on LinkedIn lately is, you know, who was your, uh, your catalyst for, for digital transformation, right? Was it your, uh, your CEO, your CTO, or was it COVID-19? And I think for the majority of the industry, I think COVID-19 is the, the, the catalyst. It's this launching point and it, it is, uh, kicking it into overdrive. No doubt. I mean, that's, just sometimes the, t- the timing on everything, right? I mean, you were looking back at it back in December. It all just hit. So uh, you're doing something right, my friend. That That's great. Yeah, very, very fortunate that they reached out to me when they did. So so you were talking about new workflows, you know, control rooms. And, and w- so what do you see? What, what do you, where do you think that's going to take uh, the next evolution? So having been a uh, a customer working at, worked in a manufacturing facility for a number of years in a in a large newsprint facility, you know the control rooms are kind of the central operation. Whether you have one large centralized control room, like a, a number of manufacturers have gone to in recent years, because it 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 created that collaboration. It had a focus for the whole facility on you know what. What are we really doing, right? What do we What do we do from our, from our product technology or from a profit standpoint? And and it got the whole organization spinning in the right direction. But now in today's environment with social distancing and those requirements, I think you're going to see control rooms become very limited as far as the number of people in a confined space. I mean, just like you, you we've had social orders of, you know, you can't have more than five people in a, in a space at a time, you're going to see, or I believe that we're going to see things come out of regulations, whether it's through the federal government, state government, whatever, that are going to have to start trying to protect employees. And it's going to make us rethink the way that we have arranged control rooms in the past. In, in the past, you may have had a, uh, a U-shaped desk that had four or five computers on it and on the wall uh, or above that, you may have had 20 or 25 monitors and you had a number of mice and, and keyboards sitting around and people would share and grab that mouse and, and look at whatever they needed to do or acknowledge whatever alarm or start what process or do their manual entry for a lab test or whatever the case might be. And so you, you had communal input devices for these com- these computers and i think that that is going to have to go away wow i mean that's 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 taking it to a new level when you sit and think about it when the control rooms i've been in i mean there's one they're typically not really that big just depending on the size of the plant but definitely people on top they're using the same resources like you said this is really going to be could take it to a new level from where we're going to have to start evaluating you know points of risk and that's it. I mean, things like touching a mouse right up behind uh, another individual, uh, that's not really going to be, the, you know, accepted, you know, in the future now. Great point. Exactly. And I think, you know, we're going to have to look at new technologies or, you know, even current technologies that we have available. You know, like my personal laptop, I, I use one Logitech uh, USB plug-in device and I have at my house, I have a docking station with a mouse and a keyboard. At the office, I have a docking station with a mouse and a keyboard. In my backpack, when I'm traveling, I have a mouse in there. And so I don't have to redeploy. I don't have to reconnect. I don't have to reconfigure anything, right? I just turn it on and it, it the, the USB binds to those devices, depending on where I'm at and, and what's in proximity to it. So I think there may be possibilities for uh, wearable input devices, right? So where where maybe you've got a, a small personalized keyboard that you're carrying around that as you walk up to a uh, a station, you know, it, it binds that USB device to it. Or, you know, how do we look at bring your own device? You know, how do we get to your iPad or your or your uh, your smartphone that you've got in your pocket? How do we put that control room in someone's pocket so they're not sharing those input devices? 
if you get it remote and you get it to where you know you are uh, putting that control room in somebody's pocket, now you can disperse the control room. Right. I guess in, uh, to a point of that though, when you get to that point, bring your own device on all these different avenues, security all of a sudden becomes extremely high to uh, from an important standpoint because you've opened up the different avenues of potential touch points into those systems. Absolutely. So that's certainly a consideration that has to be taken into place. But, you know, I think some of the constraints on security may have to be rethought a little bit. But, you know, do you uh, do you bank online? Do you bank on your phone? Do you, uh, you know, you look at Apple Pay, you go to a grocery store today. They really don't want you inserting that chip and card into that uh, scanner anymore. I mean, I went through the uh, the drive through the other day and. and they wouldn't scan my card. I had to scan my own card. So, so, so near field technologies and, and, and things like that are going to have to come and, and evolve very quickly. And there are a number of, uh, number of automation suppliers that are working in that, that direction already. What about touchless? You know, you've kind of mentioned that in the past. Where does that play, you know, in, in this space? I think it can play in a lot of different directions, right? I think, um, uh, you know, we look at things like wearable devices and having voice activated commands from those wearable devices. It, if you can put a uh, monocle or a goggle on today and you can navigate through a series of applications, you can open up Chrome or, or uh, any web browser and you can navigate to, you know, Google or wherever you want to go with voice activated commands. How do we not get to those points to where rather than having to grab a mouse and start a pump, why can we not ask Alexa to start the pump? Great. Why can we not have those types of on-prem bots built? It's all possible, isn't it? It is. In today's technology, we just have to rethink. And like I said, this is going to be the catalyst for innovation, right? And that's one of the things that uh, probably the most proud of this country for, for years and, and our throughout our history is innovation. And I think uh, the, the necessity of COVID-19 will foster a lot of innovation and you're going to see a major transformation in the way we uh, way we manufacture. So okay. so what do you think? You know, this is all cutting edge stuff and, and traditionally industrial manufacturing, uh, you know, they have ways they have processes they have uh, procedures, SOPs. What, what are going to be some of the hurdles that these plants are going to have to face head on if they want to get ahead of this and really get on this other side of, you know, digital transformation here? I don't think they have an option. I think today's environment, the things that are going on with supply chains, right? I think that uh, I mentioned, I think there, there'll be some, uh, some governance around, you know, how we operate and how we have control rooms manufactured today. I think the, uh, the issues with so much of our supply chain coming from overseas today, I think, you know, the fact that COVID-19 made a number of countries essentially shut down borders and restrict international travel, and that has impacted supply chain capability today. I think that there's going to be regulations that are going to be put forth that you're going to have to have X amount of supply chain in local proximity to what you do or manufacture today. I think that supply chains are going to become much more dispersed so that they are not as dramatically impacted as they are today. So just that in and of itself, readjusting your supply chain, readjusting where and how you manufacture goods is going to create a, a, a tsunami of new automation trends. And if you're not on that edge, and your business has been impacted significantly from the market disruption that, that has occurred and is, is going to continue to occur, you may be out of business. So being the, um, the, the curmudgeon that says, no, we can't do that, or we haven't done it that way before, I don't think you get that vote anymore. I think that, that it is foot on the accelerator. How fast can we get there? I think a lot of companies thought that they had a three-year and five-year digital transformation opportunity or they would be left uh, left behind uh, just due, out of efficiencies. 
Uh, but I think that has been accelerated rapidly in, into the 12 to 18 month window, maybe just the 12 month window, because, you know, if you're, if you're a manufacturer today and you're not in a, you know, a critical goods manufacturing environment and you're not sitting on a ton of capital or a ton of cash today, you may be out of business. Those that, that are sitting on a lot of cash, you know, it's a great M&A opportunity to, to, to go acquire it and, and disperse uh, your, your production and, and hopefully your, your supply chain. No doubt. You know, Tim, when, when I'm thinking, when you're talking about supply chain and what the plants are, how they're going to have to adjust inside, I was, I was trying to think through our listeners for a second about the individuals themselves that would be impacted and that could take the lead. Who do you see as being the, you know, the types of roles that are going to be pushed to the forefront, uh, you know, of, of making these changes? Just, just curious on your, your take here. <laughs> um. It, it is definitely the uh, directors of IT and OT. And I think there's probably going to be a much heavier emphasis on the IT infrastructure today. And so I, I'll tell you, in in recent months, and by recent months, I mean like the past year and a half, two years, everybody talks about IT, OT convergence. And I you know, I've been in the industry for a while. And for the longest time, I was like, yeah, it's, it makes perfect sense, right? We've moved to Windows as an operating system. We got Ethernet IP out there to command valves with, you know, we're, we're moving to the right architectures and infrastructures. But my realization in the past year and a half, two years is that IT has won. It is not an IT, OT convergence anymore. IT has won. It's now IOT. And the reason they won is when I think of IT, I don't think of your your local IT guy that that comes and replaces your mouse or or uh, helps install a new patch on your computer. I'm talking about what you know years ago we would have referred to as IS, the information systems or the, or the business systems, and those are just coming down faster and faster into the automation layer, and the technologies that have been deployed over the number, you know, last 15 years or so in the IT world are rapidly moving into the OT space, even faster than a lot of people recognize. I mean, uh, web-based APIs, uh, integration, interoperability across a number of platforms, tearing down data silos, that is not things that are traditionally solved in an automation platform environment that is solved at an IT level. And so those are the people that are going to lead the uh, the transformation. They're the ones that are going to uh, equip a facility with the ability to remotely support, to remotely collaborate. I think you're going to see a lot of people accept a lot of the efficiencies that have been created in the past couple of months of people working from home as the new reality, not necessarily because of social distancing going forward, but just do we really need this brick and mortar office space? Have we lost efficiency or have we gained efficiency? And the people that have gained efficiency are the ones that are going to thrive. No doubt. I mean, I can, I can even speak from, from a a distributor standpoint from where we're at. I mean, that's being evaluated across the country now too. You know, how important is the brick and mortar, you know, and, and, you can put inventory anywhere to support, you know, all these different regions from a supply chain standpoint, but the building itself, how important is that? You know, it's, it's making a lot of things being questioned right now. And I think you're all over and your, your comment about it is one that, that definitely resonated. So I guess the question is, cause we, we typically have, you know, a lot of engineers, you know, ENI techs, the, the guys that are on the floor getting it done from an automation standpoint up, how do they engage with that IT group, you know, and stay relevant and, 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 you know, support, but be there to keep things moving forward with IT? What would your advice be there? I think it's a, it's, it's a new collaboration opportunity, right? I mean, the IT or the business system people, they understand um, the business. They understand the P&L. They understand the enablers that, that, that help with, you know, whether it's supply chain management or uh, MES or MOM, 
they understand those things. What they don't understand is how a valve opens, why a valve opens, you know, what process variability does to your business, et cetera. So I think those things still remain. It's just being able to get that data up to the right people at the right time so the right decisions can be made. It's going to be an empowerment of, you know, more automation. How do we automate more and more tasks so we have fewer and fewer people in, in confined spaces working together? And then how do we ensure that that automation is operating at its peak uh, capacity? You know, I, I've told a number of people, and I'm, I'm actually trying to write a blog these days, uh, about how I think big data empowers big data. You know, back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, right, there was a huge push for multivariable controls and model-based predictive controls. And, you know, the way that you could drive a process into its constraints, whether it was a, a production constraint, a quality constraint, or, or even, you know, as uh, raw materials or energy costs went up, you could drive it against those constraints. And so you could, you could literally put a dollar sign in a PID algorithm. And those things worked. Right. It's math. It doesn't change every day. Right. So once you build a model for a facility, unless you change something in the facility, the way you produce, the model is the model. But where those things broke down and fell apart was the underlying devices. Right. The, the instrumentation, the actuators, the, uh, the pumps, the valves, the motors, the drives, you know, as things wore or as an instrument was replaced and maybe calibrated differently, right? So if you had a different instrumentation slope, you now have a different control slope. Your gain changed. And so the, the biggest transformation I see around how we get to, you know, optimized lights out manufacturing, to, to, to use some buzzwords, is the things that we're capable of doing with asset management today uh, as I mentioned, being able to combine data from numerous disparate sources into a holistic predictive maintenance asset management platform is amazing, right? We can now take hard instrumentation data from that, that instrument. We can put a number of vibration condition monitoring IoT devices on the electromechanical devices. Uh, we can control loop performance monitoring very, very easily. We can retune loops very easily. So now we can start combining that process data and that electrical data and that condition-based monitoring data. And we can combine it with the ERP system and we can actually know how much that asset costs to run and when its economic benefits are degrading due to where or mismanagement or, or underperformance of a, of a control asset. And yeah. those are things that we could think about 20 years ago, but we didn't have a compute horsepower and we didn't have the ability to, to ingest that data and, and make that data interoperable. And, and in today's IoT environment with you know, a number of different API integration capabilities, it's almost a low code or no code integration to make that possible. No doubt. That's some powerful stuff right there, isn't it? I mean, really taking it to the next level. I mean, to kind of flip just a little bit from a project execution standpoint, uh, you know, post-COVID now, things are changing. We haven't really spoke on, on that yet. W what do you see as the biggest changes there? So we as a uh, system integrator are going through basically our project execution models, and we're looking at numbers of different projects and different ways that we have executed projects in the past, whether it was a greenfield, new building, new automation system run out of an EPC or a brownfield modernization or a control system upgrade or a brownfield expansion. And we're looking at all those different types of projects and we're going through step-by-step -step or phase of, of execution of all those projects. And we're saying, okay, in the past, we have gone to site for a kickoff meeting. We have gone to site for a evaluation of the, their infrastructure, or there may have been times that we needed to go get drawings or whatever. And so we've made a lot of trips to site that in the future, 
either we're not going to be able to, or we want to minimize the impact of those touches when we do have to go to the site, right? So how do we empower one person to collaborate with 10 people in back offices while they're on site to minimize the, the contact or the touch points, right? So we're looking at a number of different technologies, wearable devices, collaboration capabilities, you know, whether that's Teams or, or uh, Zoom or any, any number of those things. But we are literally going through every step and every phase of project execution, and we are challenging how we did it, why we did it, and how do we do it differently. And the thing that is really coming to light out of this, as I mentioned earlier, is the efficiencies, right? We were, and, and we loved it. We loved the customer intimacy. We loved being in front of those customers and being able to be there and develop those relationships and that trust. But we're going to have to find ways to do that without maybe being there quite as much. And we're looking at a number of different technologies that, can enable that, you know, all the way through startup and commissioning, right? How do we remotely deploy with minimal boots on the ground, or do we leverage the boots that are already on the ground, right? With with wearable technologies, loop tuning, loop commissioning, loop monitoring, um, as I mentioned, performance monitoring uh, technology that can be built into the system as it's deployed. You know, we can ease what we traditionally did on site from a commissioning standpoint. And, you know, it saves massive amounts of T&E. I mean, just right off the top, you're saving, saving the travel expense of people having to be on site. You can create higher quality of life balance for, for our employees, right? They're not traveling near as much. And as you mentioned, how do the, the E&I guys engage with the IT, OT infrastructure? If we're leveraging the boots that are already on the ground, if we can if we can start sharing those risk and mitigations and how we do things remotely and collaborating with the customer and the customer takes a lot more interactive role in deploying and commissioning, think about their ongoing support mechanism. Think about how you have elevated and educated their on-site maintenance staff as them being a larger part of that deployment. And and the economic efficiencies for, for both. There's shared economic gains, there's shared efficiencies, and uh, I'm actually excited to, uh, to see how we, uh, how we transform our business uh, and, and hopefully the thinking of how we deploy in the future. No doubt, I mean, and, and within all this, you're adding value still. I mean, you, you haven't taken away any value from, uh, you know, the what we're delivering to, to industry. We're just thinking different ways of delivering that. And we're, we're learning every day and I love it. No doubt. I mean, that's, that's with us too. I mean, we, we're, we've adopted teams and we've actually started utilizing zoom for some training videos, just trying to think outside the box with COVID, you know, and, and still bring value to, to industry. And, and Tim, you, you have really brought a lot of value today. I, we, we call it eco why We always kind of like to wrap up with the with the why, and the why is the purpose. You know, so if you could define for our listeners the purpose, you know, why will should, you know, evaluating manufacturing post-COVID, you know, how the evolution, how that's going to work, why all this matters, how would you summarize that? In a lot of ways, I think it's survivability and sustainability, right? I mean, we, we kind of got caught a, a little unawares, hope, you know, Thankfully, a lot of us were already starting to be able to collaborate remotely and work remotely a lot more than, you know, it, had this pandemic come along in, in the, the mid 80s or, or early 90s or something, it would have been a whole different environment. So I truly think that this is the, the catalyst for change. I think it is the opportunity for us to look at the, uh, the, the conveniences that we have in our personal lives and how do we deploy those into into a business and manufacturing standpoint. No doubt. Tim, thank you so much. You've really brought just tremendous value. I mean, you're a thought leader in this space and, and I can't thank you enough for, for what you brought to our listeners today. So again, very appreciative. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. 
ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com. <laughs>